Welcome everyone to the Out and Up podcast. Big thanks to Ross and Laura behind the cameras, uh, working the audio and the video. And today I'm welcomed by David Pike. Thanks for coming here. Thanks for having me. Well, before we go into the working side of things, let's back it up a little bit and let's talk about uh, little baby David. <laughs> <laughs> when you were uh, when you were a kid, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Was it a photographer? No, no. I I was always creative growing up, mm -hmm. and uh, my parents celebrated that and and encouraged me, uh, you know, with music, with drama and acting and anything that like that. I was really into art and like drawing as a kid. I learned later in school that I wasn't actually very good at it, <laughs> even though I liked doing it. Um, Same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I've, I've heard it said that it's hard for creative people because you maybe want to see what you can, what you want to create, but you can't, you don't necessarily have the skills to get there. So right. um, I, I always want, I want to be in a band. Uh, and I did get to play in a couple bands uh, growing up and into my adult years, but uh, but photography wasn't actually on the list, at least mm. not when I was a kid. You weren't obsessed like over one thing; it was more just like playing it out and being curious. Yeah, and I and I just enjoyed creative mm -hmm. type things. Okay, I think at one point I wanted to like design characters for video games or something. Like it was <laughs> sort of whatever I was interested in. Yeah, I wanted I you know I would get really deep into something, um, but photography wasn't something that that kind of piqued my interest until I uh, sort of hit my teen years. Um, and when, from what I can remember, when it started was a trip to California I took with my family. I brought a couple of disposable cameras with me uh, just to, you know, kind of take photos because we're on this like two week trip up the coast of California. Amazing. And uh, didn't know what I was doing. And you don't really have to do much with a disposable camera. You just... Yeah take photos uh but i remember it was like a really special trip and i'd never been to that part of the continent before and when i got them developed they were they were really cool um and that's not because of any skill i had back then maybe uh, a very naive eye for like some cool moments or like a sunset or something but i still uh look back on those photos even though i have no idea where the negatives are and uh i think that's kind of where it started because all of a sudden I had these little ephemeral, you know, four, three by five prints mm -hmm. of this really amazing trip to a place I'd never been to. Well, Interesting. So do you have them like laying around your house right now? Like the prints? I have no idea where they are or the negatives. <laughs> um, and that's something I've learned is to like keep things. Store and, them. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that was 17 years ago. Right. Um, I had no idea where those negatives Is are. there any picture from that like collection that you remember the most? Like, was it a palm tree? Was it somebody skateboarding? It was, so it was, it was a sunset photo that I took of one of the lookout points, um, with the sun kind of setting behind it. Mm -hmm. And it was just a bunch of people's silhouettes, really small in the oh, photo. Cool. Wow. But the way the, the disposable film and the way the camera ex uh, exposed it um it was just really cool something that now you would expect to be edited with like an instagram filter or whatever but it just kind of developed that way so it was like really saturated and mm. really like dark in the foreground like it just turned out really cool and at the time i would have had no idea what i had done or what the camera would have done to do that but i still remember those shots right and you've created a business around being a photographer Growing up as a kid, was there anyone around you that was entrepreneurial or had a business, like any family members, friends? Yeah, my my dad uh, owns his own business. A um, little different than mine. He's a dental surgeon. Okay, um, yeah, just a little. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they take pictures. So funny enough, they they used to have to before digital imaging. <laughs> my one of my first film cameras that I used growing up was an old camera my dad used to take photos of wow. teeth. <laughs> I'm not. I'm being totally serious right that now. That is so have to cool. Put this super long macro lens in someone's mouth. No way. And click, like, mm, so. Yummy. Mind you, his was <laughs> function. I, my dad wasn't a photographer, but he had the, the equipment. And 
I've had other family members who are, uh, I think, business oriented, but no one really in this, uh, like in a creative space, uh, more so uh, what we consider sort of capital B business type ventures. Cool. And what were you like as a kid? I was I was a pretty outgoing kid and creative, I think, though, like I said, I don't know how good I was at any of those things, mm-hmm. but um, I think I was like I said, outgoing and, uh, I liked performing. I liked creating. I liked people seeing what I did. Uh, so whatever I could participate in in school, uh, like I did some musical theater when I was really young, okay. which I haven't <laughs> really gone back to, but yeah. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed creating with other people as well. Mm-hmm. I think that's why I enjoyed things like that. Um, and that's why I enjoy playing in a band because you get to, make something that's bigger than just you. How did growing up gay impact your childhood? Cause I think like, did you, did you understand that part of yourself when you were a little kid or is that something you discovered over time? It's definitely something that clicked. Uh, once I reached some kind of age of maturity and I think for a lot of kids, that's actually a pretty low number. Um, like I said, I was always interested in, creative things even from a really young age and i was kind of not interested in traditionally like boy things sports and beating each other other up at recess and like stuff like that like i i do remember in elementary school there was that feeling of kind of otherness where like i liked like hanging out with the guys but i also liked hanging out with girls and i wanted to do sometimes what they were doing versus what the guys were doing. So there was that kind of push pull thing, um, which as I know now, doesn't necessarily define your sexuality or who you are. But I think at least for me, it was an indicator that like, okay, I'm not exactly like the boys and I have other interests that maybe aren't, aren't theirs. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until I was about probably entering high school that I was like, Oh, something is different. Interesting. About me. Um, cause that would have been, you know, like 15 something years ago. Um, and n- fewer people were out and open about those things. So it took a little while for me to, to understand, like, is this, is this me? Is this who I am? You know? And, and then there did come a point where I was like, okay, no, maybe I don't want, want this or like, oh, I like, yeah. how do I stop this from happening? Cause mm-hmm. it's scary at, you know, when you kind of realize it and you feel like, oh, I might be the only one who feels this way or who identifies this way and it can be really isolating. So there was that, that period where, uh, I kind of felt like I kind of was resisting a little, a little bit. Yeah. And you, you mentioned being scared uh, of isolation and things like that. Was there also a sense of like shame about it more so than fear? Um, I think a little bit, and that's probably because of, uh how i was raised and kind of the environment that i was in like i went to a a christian high school uh and stuff like that actually most a lot of my education was like in sort of christian schools and and was sort of active in that community growing up um Mm -hmm. so that was that was part of it um i don't i don't ever think it was like shame it was just like awareness like self-awareness of like you know all of a sudden i felt like there was some kind of like separation between me and other people or maybe my friends. Right. Um, and just kind of hyper aware of like, okay, what, how do I, how do I deal with this? What does this mean? Mm-hmm. All of that. And growing up with Christian beliefs, that must've been hard to come out like to your family and things like that. Yeah. It kind of happened accidentally <laughs> as it, uh, as it often does when you're a teenager. And, uh, and so that was, that was a bit of an awkward period of my life. Um, what do you mean you by accident? Uh, <laughs> when you're, when you're young and, uh, exploring your sexuality, um, <laughs> sometimes you need reference material, let's call it. And, uh, well, anyway, let's just say when you're young, you don't okay. always know how to hide I'm your Connecting tracks. the dots here. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. Caught red handed. Yeah. Yeah. But, but if it wasn't that, it would have been something else. Do you right, know what I mean? Like okay. it's, it's, 
it wasn't like one little mistake. It was like, no, it was probably going to come to a head mm-hmm. at some point anywhere. So that's just how it happened. Um, and that was kind of kind of halfway through high school, maybe 11th grade. And, uh, and so I just kind of dealt with it. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a comfortable period of my life, but it was something that I had already dealt with myself over those couple years leading up to it, where once it happened, I sort of knew, well, this is me. And, uh, and so I just kind of went from there and, and focused on myself and how do I, how do I become the person that I maybe want to be, which is hard <laughs> at that age, but at least yeah. like it just, it actually made me focus more on myself because of how, how much friction there was around me surrounding coming out. So you essentially got outed by your family after they discovered these materials. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's. <laughs> and like, how did, what happened after that? Like was. It was, it was difficult for everyone involved. It was difficult for my family, my parents who grew up with a certain belief system and also grew up in a time where um, that wasn't, not only was it not the norm, it just wasn't, it wasn't right, Mm -hmm. whatever that means. Yeah. Um, And I, I have older parents as well. So they just like generally, generationally, um, they, it just didn't make any sense to them. And then coupled with their belief system, uh, it was just kind of a recipe for like, you know, well, this can't be right. And, and trying to figure out how to fix it or how to change it or how to get rid of it. Right. Um, so. And with that, as far as like fixing it, there's things like conversion therapy. Was that part of your coming out as well? Yeah, we, we did some of that. I had a, I had a counselor uh an ex-gay counselor guy who was ex-gay wow yeah who i was very attracted to (laughs) and i told him that (laughs) i was like this isn't gonna work i'm very attracted to you well this was in high school yeah i was like 17 probably okay um there was him there was like my youth pastor as well at the time from the church that my parents went to um and a couple of other people like involved and I'm fortunate because I was raised by great parents and uh, I think they taught me how to be smart at a young age about other stuff. Mm -hmm. But by that point I was a pretty smart kid, at least in that moment about self-preservation. So I knew that this is something that I was going to go through, but I had the choice of how to kind of navigate it and kind of say the right things and listen and do whatever I need to do to make it sort of as painless as possible and make it go away um, as fast as possible. Not making my sexuality go away, but making the, the issue of we got to fix this. Right. Um, yeah. I, w- I was just, I think smart planning on my part to not uh, resist it, but kind of go with the flow because that allowed me to kind of, get through that part of my life and into my adult mm. life and my independence um, where I've been able to kind of flourish. Right. And what does fixing it entail as far as like that journey? Like when, when somebody is going through that, like what does it look like just cause I've never, never been through it or I've never had anyone kind of explain it. Depending, depending on your belief system. And I'm talking about a particularly fundamental Christian set of beliefs. Um, you know, it's, it's seen as, uh, a choice and a wrong choice and uh, sin. I'm using air quotes. Uh, um, whatever that means. I mean, it's mm-hmm. morally subjective. But if you adhere to that belief system, it's like, well, you are making a choice to live like this or be this way, and so you don't have to do this. You can, you know, you can change it. You can live a normal life. You can live, you know, as you're supposed to which right. is to fall in love with someone of the opposite gender and start a family and like all of, all of that. Um, at least that's the example that was set. So I knew that I need to just kind of not talk about what I was feeling or what I was kind of going through and just say, okay, yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you yeah, put I the like mask on. Yeah, totally. That's what it was. It was just a, a veneer of, 
whatever I needed to say or do to sort of just get through that process. And then I could just take that off and be right. And again, keep kind of work on myself in that time because it was a bit of an isolating time for me. So again, yeah. I was just focusing on me and my interests and my, I don't know, my skills. Uh, mm -hmm. What during that period of kind of covering up who who I was. Right. And I think it's so interesting that you forecasted the future of that. Like you're like, I wish to get through this and then this is going to happen afterwards. And picturing it like that is, is really interesting. But at the same time, like, like you mentioned, it's isolating and there must have been so much like internal friction as far as like, cause to your core, you knew it wasn't working out and you were just going through the motions. How did you stay confident during those times? I think that, I think that I was confident. It's actually hard to remember uh, that far back. And I probably like repressed a couple of those memories. Yeah, I imagine. But I've always been pretty forward facing in, in terms of, you know, what's next, what's coming up. I was like that a lot in school. I was like that with, you know, anticipating summer and next year and this. And, uh, and even by that point in my life, I was excited to go to college or university and, and start working. And like, I, I, and I always had older friends too. I had a lot of uh, really cool and inspiring people in my life uh, during my formative years. And so I was always looking at them and what they were doing or what, what was next for them. And I kind of wanted that as well. Right. So I was always, I think that's kind of what dragged me through it was looking ahead, allowed me to just kind of slide through because I knew there were going to be other things and that that was not any kind of like ending. It was right. just like a kind of, uh, whatever metaphor you want to use, kind of a little roadblock, a little, yeah. little dip. Um, so I just tried to stay focused on, on what was ahead right. and I didn't know what that was necessarily, but I was just like, we're something else is going to happen here. Yeah. I think that's also true for any situation. That's something you don't want to go through. You know, things are oftentimes temporary, but they're often like block a lot of people and like overcast like their headspace. Uh, so just having that good perspective of, of what's afterwards or it could get worse or things like that really help you get through those tough times. So it's a, it's a good perspective. Thanks for sharing. That's totally. like super personal as well. So I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I know it's something that, that um, a lot of people have gone through or have to go through right now. And uh, it's, I think I was lucky in that I was accidentally resourced with the ability to kind of exist on my own. Mm -hmm. I, I was, people often ask if I'm, I'm an only child. I'm not, I do have a younger sister. Um, but why do people ask you that? Because I was, I was very independent from a very young age. Uh, and my, my sister needed a little more, uh, care, uh, growing up. She had, she has special needs. So, okay. um, so from a very young age, I've been able to like, entertain myself or take care of myself. Not that I wasn't taken care of, but just at least in existing in my own space, I've from a young age, I've been able to kind of do that and hold my own with, with other people. So I was really fortunate in that way. And I know that some people have had to go through what I've gone through and it is, it's an awful experience. And, and mm -hmm. the fact that it still happens is like totally insane to me. But, um, I think that I'm evidence that, things do absolutely get better and you can become stronger from experiences like that. And I think, uh, the federal government's looking to ban conversion therapy as well. Good. In Canada, at least. Good. Yeah. So there is some good movement there and hopefully that happens. One of the individuals who was responsible for a lot of it in the States, I don't know what ministry was from. He came out in the last what two or three weeks, <laughs> finally at the age of 50 something. And, and, Oh my goodness. I don't begrudge him that experience, but it is totally crazy that, that someone could, anyway, oh, I just, man. I think it's, I think it's crazy. And I'm, I'm That's hoping super that, intense. Yeah. I just, I, I do hope that very soon we see, you know, an understanding that people are, are different. And if your kids are different, whatever that may mean, they're still your, your kids. And, right. Yeah. yeah. And Going through those dark times, uh, whether they're dark or not, but just like going through those struggles, 
did you have any like gay friends or allies or like how did because you do have a big network of, of gay friends around you today like were they there back then or th how did that happen for you not really uh i was i went to a smaller high school to begin with um and i was the first person to come out there okay. so um that was uh that was an interesting experience people were supportive when i actually did come out to my friends and my peers people were pretty cool because you know that was already 2000 i guess that would have been 2005 or 2006 and already at that point uh gay was being seen more in the mainstream mm -hmm. and and people could talk about it more so the fact that i came out wasn't the end of the world and some people were totally cool about it and and in some ways like in a tokenizing way it was kind of cool because they had a gay friend now right uh, but i didn't have the same kind of network or relationships that i do now but those are something that i've developed and seen the importance of since uh since coming out so did girls start asking you to consult their outfits yeah, like immediately absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. yeah and a lot of my male friends asked uh if i was going to hit on them and i said right no you're not my type <laughs> no <laughs> just you know the those sort of shots like, yeah. you know obvious qu questions or whatever. And, <laughs> and you know i was also really fortunate because even though it was 2006 or 2007 like i had the internet as a resource yeah even just for information or like you said uh, about a network um this was before tumblr and this was before instagram but i had a live journal myspace just as myspace was was kind of becoming a thing so yeah i guess i had a live journal and then it turned into myspace but this was like just before Facebook and right. everything like that. So I had a bit of an outlet there and I had some gay friends online, at least, who I could kind of talk to um, in a more of a primitive way than we can now where we can FaceTime someone or, you know, mm -hmm. instantaneous communication. But it was nice to have that resource as well because I know there's people who are older than me who didn't have that anything like that. Yeah, I think if you grow up in like a smaller town, like those digital resources totally often come totally pretty hard. And I think it's important because it teaches you that like the world is a very big place. It's bigger than your your small town or your city or your province or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes back to the looking ahead sort of thing. You know, I think travel is important. And by travel, I mean just getting outside of wherever you grew up or whatever your experience has been, mm -hmm. um, because it shows you there's a very big world out there and there's a lot of people out there and you might find some people who are like you if you feel like you're different from other people owning your identity was the thing that has allowed me to get where i am in my in my career because my my business is me and mm -hmm. it's my hands and it's my eye and my ability with a camera and and ultimately my reputation and so i in that process of coming out I I think I really had the time to figure out who I was. Um, and that's, you know, you're always changing, you're always growing, and you're learning new things, hopefully. Um, the older I get, the more I realize, like, I don't really know anything. <laughs> but, but having that confidence and having that independence, I think is really important when you own your own business, especially when you're a team of one. Yeah. Um, when you're not... You, you know, I don't have employees, I don't have coworkers, I don't have uh, a partner in a business sense. It's just me at the end of the day running running mm -hmm. my business. So that's something I learned as I was coming out was it, it's just you for right now. Right. So you need to make sure you can kind of hold it together and you uh, are kind of complete. Love that. Wow. And how did you get started in photography? Like, was that during school or during high school? college did you go to did you go to school for it no i went to i went to the university of toronto for art history because at that time i was really into art but uh not anymore i i still am <laughs> i i realized i didn't want to spend a decade in academia getting a phd so that i could work in a gallery i still love art um and i wonder if it's influenced my work as a creative person, but I love studying art and I love the aesthetic side of it. And I love the historical side of it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to work in galleries. Um, but 
I, I st essentially started my business while I was in university. To go back, I, I started taking photos in high school and it kind of lines up with, with coming out um, as an outlet for kind of what I was going through. That's also when I started learning about the film cameras that I had because I started shooting film, not, not digital. And, you know, a lot of it was photos a high school student would take of like power lines or, or I don't know, it's yeah. weird self portraits and stuff the like shadow. that. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, it was an outlet for me too, because photography is, is intensely, it's personal and it is an independent medium. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can be just you and a camera can be other people can be involved but ultimately it's it was just at that time it was me and a camera and so because of that experience that I was going through with with coming out it it just kind of fit yeah whereas you know it was just I I kind of felt safe with my camera and it allowed me to kind of see things and the lens is an interesting way of separating yourself from whatever you're taking a photo of mm -hmm. um so that's that's where I started. And then And just to like piggyback that, I think also photography is a great way to meditate and just like force yourself to be in the moment because you're really like looking at what's in front of you, what's the lighting like. You know, you're not thinking about oh, I just hit the mic there. You're not thinking about uh the future or the past or anything like that. You're really present. So I think even through your coming out, like that's a great way just to be immerse yourself and even distract yourself, but also just like a form of meditation. I think you're absolutely right because unlike other n mediums like, you know, painting or drawing where you can kind of create something out of nothing with photography, it requires you to have s something in front of you, whatever it is. So you have to be present. Mm -hmm. I was never good at creating something in abstraction. I think that's why I was never good at, at painting or drawing, but with photography, I can see something in front of me different than other people would see it. And I think that's, that's one of the abilities I have, which I don't even know if it's a technical ability, but I think it's just a unique, I think it's unique to everyone. Yep. Cause if you give two people cameras, they're going to shoot whatever's in front of them differently. Yeah. I always love those YouTube channels of like four photographers shoot the same model. And totally. Like the outcomes are just so different. Yeah. Yeah. Can love have it. same gear and same backdrop or lighting and they're all, they're all going to be different. And I cut you off there, but you're kind of going into how you got started uh, in photography, like during college or after college. Yeah, to keep it short, because I'm there were a lot of little plot points in how I got to where I am. But I mentioned that I was also really into music and played in a couple bands, and a bunch of my friends had started bands in high school, and so my love of music and my love of like. Uh, punk and indie music that was very th those are very visual genres and the the records from those genres tended to have like tons of really cool photos and the liner notes and stuff oh. um and so i offered to take photos for my friends bands in high school because they were starting out they were playing some concerts so that turned into something and i kind of ran with that i i loved going to concerts i loved music and so i got the opportunity to shoot not necessarily anyone big or famous, but it was another outlet for me. And it was a way for me to teach myself how to take photos and what worked and what wouldn't work and, mm -hmm. and how to do that. And that led into, um, my first week of university. Um, there was, there's, was a concert for Frosh week. It was stars and the hidden cameras, some quality Canadian indie rock. <laughs> Um, and, and I had brought my camera and by that point, I think I had a, a digital SLR, um, Pentax or something like that. And I was taking photos, not for anyone, but just for me mm -hmm. to kind of, to document it. It's something that I had been doing. And there was a guy at the show who said, Hey, who are you shooting for? And that's not a question anyone had ever asked me before. And I said, nobody, myself. And he's like, cool. Well. I don't know if he had a card on him or something, but he, he said, can you send me some of your shots? He uh, ended a up USB being, stick. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so like, literally <laughs> a, a floppy drive of yeah. the photos. <laughs> I'm not that old. 
Um, and so I sent them to him and he ended up, he was the photo editor of the campus publication at U of T and that developed a really cool relationship and friendship with him. He was a big inspiration to me and ultimately led to me working in, uh, journalism and, uh, and at the campus publication, I was photo editor there for two years later on in, in university. And, and that it was kind of fractal in its, um, in the way opportunities opened up, it was one thing and there was another, and then it was three other things. It just, yeah. To go from shooting, you know, really loud bands at venues that only hold a hundred people to shooting Toronto fashion week for the first time or shooting the president of U of T and then shooting uh, a sports event. And like all of these opportunities uh, came out of that. Um, and that's, that's really where I see my business starting mm -hmm. because I started developing a network and I started de developing relationships with people and even in university building uh, relationships with people who then went on to be not just friends, but clients and, and really great opportunities for me. Yeah. And you touched on how important relationships are for getting started and meeting the right person leading to something else, to something else. How important is partnerships to you now, as far as like managing clients and expectations and building relationships and just like meeting people outside of that, that essentially could open new doors or opportunities or invite you to new events and capture new moments, maybe outside of what you're used to. For me and my business relationships are everything, like absolutely everything. I, I would be absolutely nowhere without the, the relationships that I've built. And, and I specifically say relationships because I don't, I understand the word network and the verb networking, but to me, they don't feel as, as genuine because, you know, relationships are two way streets and I, you know, I value them a lot. I don't, I've never been the type to just hand out my card blindly to people so that they mm -hmm. hire me. It's, you know, to me about establishing, establishing trust, establishing expectations, uh, you know, being available to someone else when they need it. Um, you know, I, I, part of my success is that I've just always said yes to everything in my career. If a client needs something, I just say yes. Um, cause I want them to know they can count on me, hmm. you know, even if it's maybe last minute. Um, yeah, relationships are absolutely everything because talent and ability are, are so important, but I could introduce you to a dozen photographers in Toronto, just off the top of my head who are so talented and, and so good at what they do. Uh, and, and they're doing amazing work too. Um, but your success is about the relationships you build and your work comes from the relationships that you build and deliberately build. Um, and that started happening after coming out was you kind of become more uh, deliberate and conscious of who you invest in and who you develop relationships with. It's not just friends by because of proximity or convenience. You you invest in people that, you know, you see a future with whatever that means. I'm not right. talking about romantic, but um, that's those relationships have have developed for me into uh, some really cool opportunities. And you've done a lot of really cool stuff over the years. And you talk about like a lot of different uh, opportunities that you've been lucky to be a part of. What's one that stands out? Like what's your biggest accomplishment in your head? Oh my goodness. Um, like in regards to photography. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Some, some of the stuff that sticks out in my head would might be boring to, to some people because very often I, I take photos for other photographers. We're always interesting. We're not competing, but I, I think about what, what would another photographer think or another creative person think if they saw this photo or, or whatever it is uh, for, for the average person. Um, I know that Anna Wintour has seen some of my photos from Anna Wintour from Vogue. Um, and I found out after, the shoot that she was actually going to be seeing them and that I'm glad I didn't know before. Cause I probably would have been 
wow. been sweating. <laughs> um, you know, I've been able to photograph, um, I've photographed some politicians. I've photographed lots of celebrities. I shot the Toronto Film Festival for a couple of years, which was a really cool opportunity and really pulls back the curtain on our kind of obsession with celebrity yeah. when you're right in front of someone who you see mm -hmm. TV and movies like that was really cool. And I think really important too for me, um, cause it taught me that to one thing that's going to make you success, successful as a photographer is treating people like people, no matter if they're a uh, stranger on the street that you're, you know, shooting some street photography of, or if they are a very, very high profile celebrity or a, politician or wh whoever it is just treat people like treat people just be kind to people um and and treat your subjects well um i try to make a point of any models that i shoot for any of my editorial and commercial work i i tell them that you know i'm taking a photo of you and you are wearing these clothes you're not a mannequin you're not you know i'm like you're a person mm -hmm. i want to get to know you and then I want to take photos of you, whatever the job may be, you know, if we're shooting raincoats or something like that. I want them to feel comfortable because I think I get better photos out of them when they feel like I'm talking to them as a person, not just as a, a body that I'm putting clothes on. Right. You take a lot of photos with your iPhone. I think you showed me the other day you have like almost 100,000 photos on your phone. Yeah, it's... it's uh, I'm maybe a bit of a hoarder when it comes to <laughs> photos and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to lose anything. I've, I've lost, <laughs> I've lost data before when I didn't understand what it meant to like backup photos and yeah. archive photos. So now I'm just kind of obsessive with yeah. having all my photos in a million different places so that I never lose any of them. Yeah. And I, I love my iPhone and I love taking photos, you know, because I'm so fortunate to take photos for a living and my gear is so big and so cumbersome sometimes I don't always take my camera um, places that I may want to take photos or I may want to capture moments of right. the more gear you get and the bigger your gear is it's hard harder to have that with you for those moments because I gotta mm -hmm. take out my bag and put in a memory card but my phone is always on me and it's not, everyone always has their phone on so what's one photo that sticks out to you or like what's one photo you've taken with your phone that's like ingrained in your head that you'll never forget? I think, I think it's my travel photos. I, I almost never bring my, my professional gear with me when I'm traveling because uh, it's heavy and because I don't want to lose it or get it damaged or, you know, yeah. insurance reasons. Are you carry on or do you bring uh, do you check a bag? Uh, I check a bag for different reasons okay. because I, <laughs> I need to have three different black t-shirts to wear every single day yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but my phone's always with me and and yeah. as technology has gotten better and as the you know cameras have developed i can take great photos and and i take photos for myself primarily i don't do a ton of personal work with my professional gear or at least in a professional setup but a lot of the photos i take are for me and to remember things and to kind of document things as they happen and kind of what you said, being present in the moment, yep. taking photos is my way to do that, to force myself to look at what's around me, to see things, to wait a bit, because sometimes the perfect photo isn't immediately. Sometimes you have to wait a minute, 10 minutes, an hour. Like it may not be right in front of you. And sometimes you have to be patient with it, at least with what I want to see. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I have something in my pocket at all times so I can always yeah capture a moment and that's one of the reasons i like social media too there's a lot wrong with uh our consumption i think of social media but <laughs> it uh it at least allows me to create like a visual record of people and important moments in my life Places. and yeah like just everything <laughs> so i can scroll back and say oh yeah i remember when i did that or met this person or whatever it was cool uh through photography, we talked a lot about like really great opportunities and a lot of like peaks. Um, what are some of like the lower times in your, your business? Uh, just because like we talk about struggles of coming out, but what have been some of the bigger struggles for you as an independent entrepreneur? Uh, Cause you've been in this space for so long. Let's talk about some of the lower times in your business journey. 
and you say yes to everything. So like, there's potentially some things where you're like, I shouldn't have said yes to this. Some fail forward moments, maybe. Yeah, there's there's definitely been some some projects that I wasn't I wasn't ready for, or maybe didn't understand expectations fully, or whatever it may be. And those are great learning experiences, and they're really good at making you self conscious and self aware, which I I don't think are terrible things when <laughs> when you're you know, a, a creative person or running your own business. Um, so you know what you're kind of biting off and, and can you, can you deliver? Um, you know, so much of my work is for clients and I always want to make sure I'm meeting expectations and delivering on a vision or whatever it is. And there've absolutely been photos um, and shoots that I've done where I'm like, I'm so grateful for the opportunity, but I was like, I was not the dude for this job. And, <laughs> and I'm like so embarrassed by it. But I think that embarrassment is healthy because it, it, if nothing else, it just kind of inspires you to like get better. Or, uh, I, I mentioned, you know, creative people sometimes can see what they want, but don't always know how to execute it. Yeah. Um, so that's something I've been really focusing on now in my career is like having a vision, but also being able to execute it on my own and, and developing my skills or just abilities, even with, with photo editing and retouching so that I, the photos in my head um, can actually become a, a reality. And, and from a business sense, like, you know, starting a business is hard and invoicing and chasing clients for those invoices, you know, that's hard and cash flow is a weird thing. And so there was a couple points um, at the start of my business when I was transitioning from working in retail and I was putting on concerts for a little while and, and I had clients, but I, you know, it was, it was weird managing all of those things. And I felt like I had no time for anyone because I was trying to do so much. Um, but I needed to go through that so that I could, again, develop those relationships with clients, get, bigger projects, um, and ultimately go fully freelance. Is there one example of failure that sticks out the most though? That like allowed you to grow? Maybe I've been really fortunate. I don't think, that, I don't think there nothing, was, nothing I don't think out. there was like one instance. I okay. think there's been all like, like these micro examples of like yeah, learning. I, I don't think there was ever a point where, where I like totally blew it. So okay. to speak. Okay. Um, I think, like I mentioned before, like it, if if starting a business and not having any money at the start of it, and like that feeling of like, you know, that's that's a really isolating like second feeling. second guessing yourself. Yeah, you're like, w was this the right choice? Like, yeah. is anyone going to call me? Is anyone going to hire me? Um, losing clients and they're you know, clients do come and go. That does happen in, in, in our business. Um, that's happened a couple times. Ne there's never been a, like a fatal blow where I lost a client and couldn't pay rent, but I definitely have seen clients come and go and, and haven't always been able to keep every single one of my clients. And so those things are also healthy reminders that, you know, you need to value the relationships that you do have and while you have them, because, um, in as much as I'm, okay at what I do, uh, you know, I've, you're only as good as your last shoot or your last project. Like, you know, things are always changing. So when it, when a client doesn't come back, that's another reminder that like, you know, I got to value and maintain the relationships that I still have. Cool. And I mean, it's a good thing you don't have any. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> a great reason to reflect. Maybe you're not taking big enough risk, but. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, and a lot of your projects now are leading towards product photography and you're kind of elevating that craft. Like, how do you make product photography more interesting, especially because there's so much content out there? There is. Um, and that's something I, I do in my, in my work is I produce content for, for brands. And that's been a really interesting challenge because I want to, I want to create really cool <laughs> photos but I got to create a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out ways to kind of contextualize 
or decontextualize products and how we think about them. And sometimes it's shooting makeup and beauty products with uh, really rough materials or shooting a pair of shoes in a in a room or in a situation where that pair of shoes probably wouldn't be like it's it's sometimes fun to take things out of their element or out of the way we would associate them with uh you know with with fashion and with editorial stuff and sometimes putting them in different contexts and i've been really inspired by some other photographers and, and creatives that i've seen doing stuff like that um and you see that in the in the fashion world sometimes taking high fashion yeah. and bringing it down to streetwear or street style even mm -hmm. um outside of like runway shows or whatever it's it's interesting mixing like high and low um and just kind of i think that's maybe where a bit of my art background comes into because i love like i always loved surrealism and i always loved you know abstraction and abstract expressionism and it's like how can i bring at least like references of that into a medium that doesn't always allow for surrealism let's say mm -hmm. Um, so there's nothing that's like rinse and repeat. You're always just trying to push the barrier and think outside the box. Or is there some things where you're like, oh, I, I know what this looks like because I've done it before. Or both. I don't know if I can get in trouble for self plagiarizing, but I never want to. So that's something I'm always aware of is, <laughs> you know, have I shot this before? Am I, am I actually being creative here or am I mm. phoning it in? Yeah. And, and I'd like to think that I'm always trying to bring something new uh, to whatever it is that I'm I'm doing and that's a struggle it absolutely there are days where I don't feel creative and I don't and you know I my eyes don't feel fresh and I also try to bring um, what I've done in with some subjects to other photos I think about you know if I've shot you know something more documentary style how can I bring that to a maybe a fashion landscape or or whatever it is so I try to be interdisciplinary in and what I'm shooting, because that'll sometimes keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. And I wonder sometimes if I consume enough media or too much media uh, in terms of like inspiration from other photographers and stuff, because we we have so much on our phones. And sometimes I actually feel like the more I look at, the less creative I yeah. am sometimes, mm -hmm. because I'm just seeing too many photos taken by other people and and people doing really cool stuff. But it it almost keeps me in my own head and, and doesn't allow me to try new things. So interesting because like you said, there's a lot of, <clears throat> there's a lot more content out there. There's a lot more people with cameras. What's some advice for somebody that's looking to get started in photography like today? Take photos. <laughs> take lots of them. <laughs> take lots of photos. Seriously. <laughs> take so many photos. I used to tell people, you know, get a film camera and write down for each photo, the settings you used and the exposures to kind of teach yourself photography. I never studied photography. Uh, I'm still learning uh, technical things. Um, take tons of photos. Try things. Offer to take photos for friends or peers or whoever that are maybe doing cool things. Or, you know, like I said, I... I my friends were all in bands, so I took photos of that and them playing in shows. So I, I don't necessarily know what that would look like for a new photographer, but, you know, if you have a friend that's a musician or an artist or a business owner in a different capacity, you know, growing your portfolio, growing your, it's not even so much about your portfolio, it's about your experience of shooting mm -hmm. different things and just keep shooting, keep shooting and build those relationships because... You never know where people are going to end up and you you hope that they remember you and your eye or at least how you take photos um, or whatever it is that you do. Yeah, and, and you uh, can stumble upon something that you would specialize in that you could have never realized before if you're just like, oh, now I'm going to shoot product. Now I'm going to shoot sports or totally. whatever the case may be. Totally. You literally shoot everything, um, you know, ass assist for people, um, you know, when you can. That's something I wish I had done when I was younger was assist for better photographers than I and learn from them, or at least in that, in that. So moment. you never had a, a mentor? Not 
in the way that I probably should have. Do you have one today? Not in the way that I probably <laughs> should have. Um, that could have been a failure. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Like never seeking for that guidance, I guess. Because that's a huge one for me, especially. It helps me so much. Totally. And I think, I think that advice is probably given to people who pick this as a career path maybe a little earlier on or, or get to study it mm -hmm. in university. I think that, you know, with sort of an internship model or, or something, there's a little more hands-on. I was finishing, you know, a, an academic degree and just was taking a lot of photos and this kind of happened. So I do, I do still feel like I could, uh, I could have used maybe a little more guidance, but uh, I'm just trying to make up and pick up that slack yeah. as I continue on. <laughs> well, I think that's a good tip for anyone, regardless if you're a photographer or a cook or anybody, a drag queen, like find the people who've done it before you and, and get that guidance and soak it all up. And, and seek out people that, that who like inspire you and reach out to them. And there's a really good chance that they would be willing to mm -hmm. share with you. Um, I've, I've developed with a friend, a friendship with someone uh, in, he lives in Los Angeles and he's a food photographer and he shares stuff on, on social media, some behind the scenes stuff. And we're close enough now where I can ask, I feel comfortable asking him and qu him questions and he will always answer them so graciously and, and share whatever he, he knows. Cause there's often times where I'm like, okay. I feel like he would know how to do this, but I have no idea how to cool. you know, light something this way or whatever. So having those resources, I think, is really important. Um, and and I think it's important to also, you know, tell people who inspire you that they inspire you, you know, like, you know, share that. Like, I, I'm fortunate to know a lot of really incredible photographers in the city, and I... I go out of my way to tell them that their, you know, their work inspires me or that, you know, they did a really cool shoot for whatever yeah. it was um, just for encouragement because I, I, I don't feel competitive with, with other creatives. I'm fortunate to live in a, a city as big as Toronto and, you know, there's, there's so much work and there's, there's the right people for a lot of jobs. And I hope that whatever uh, creative is doing, you know, that's, that's for them. Um, I don't see other creatives as my competition. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to praise not only the people who are incredibly inspiring, like above you and have been there, done that, but also the people like beside you on the same playing field. And then also the people that are like coming up after you, or just like inspiring that next wave of blank, whether that's photographers or whatever. I think that's super critical in the growth of the people around you in the community and, and your industry as a whole as well. Absolutely. And I, and I see even just stuff on social media of like these like photographers a decade younger than me doing like really, really cool stuff. And I mm -hmm. think it's, I think it's totally rad. And I've had people reach out to me on social media and ask me, you know, how did I shoot this or, you know, what kind of lens should I buy? And, you know, whatever little piece of, information I can share or help them with. I'm happy to happy to share that. Thanks for sharing so much about like the insights into your business and coming out. We're just kind of like wrapping up to the end of the podcast and I have this new fun section called fill in the blanks that I'd love cool. for you to try out and yeah. be part of. <laughs> There's only a few questions, so it's not gonna be too long, but uh, if I could go anywhere right now, I would go to Japan. Oh, interesting. I take photos because I take photos because I want to remember things or for other people to remember them. Hmm. I wish I never. Uh, uh, <laughs> I wish I never. Based on what we talked about er earlier on, you would think I would say, I wish I never, you know, stuff about coming out or whatever. I don't. I'm glad, I'm glad things have happened the way they have so far in my life. I've been really fortunate. I wish I never, uh, quit playing in a band. Mm, good answer. When I think of Drake Andrews, I think of, <laughs> I think of sneakers. Sneakers. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, if I could tell someone who's looking to come out 
parents any advice what would i tell them do it do it do it. <laughs> okay. it 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 may feel hard it may feel impossible um it it may not feel like the right time and then you can wait but you know you are you are doing yourself a disservice by not living as authentically as you can and and being true to who you are mm. uh, you know if i'm an example or if other people who have gone through what i've gone through are, are examples you know things do get better and you can be who you want to be and people are going to love you for that and accept you for that so um it may feel hard at first but it is something worth doing i agree i love that and the last one the best part about being gay is <laughs> being taken seriously as a creative person <laughs> Um, which is not, which is not true. I mean, I know, I don't think, I don't think sexuality has a lot to do with, with creativity because I know people on all parts of the spectrum who are creative, mm -hmm. but for, for clients, sometimes they, they just assume that I'm a safe choice because I'm gay. Interesting. So they're like, oh, he knows fashion or he knows <laughs> leverage that <laughs> style or like what's so funny is when i when i maybe a, a, clients ask me about like makeup looks or like anything beauty related which i don't know anything about yeah even as a as a gay man i i, I don't foundation and primer I, like i have no idea um so that's always really funny where they're like oh no no it's fine he's gay he like definitely can <laughs> like <laughs> gotta break those stereotypes i guess yeah <laughs> cool well just wrapping up any other messages you want to share before we go i think uh you know i think it's important to realize uh, as a creative person and a small business owner how fortunate i am to be both of those things and and do that and uh and you know like i said i think relationships are so important with whatever you end up doing and uh, starting a business. Um, I, I have learned and grown as a photographer and in my technical ability, but all of that is kind of secondary to the relationships that I built and the opportunities that have been afforded to me. Um, and that's really how I ended up here. And that's, uh, that's really what I hope other people find success in is is building relationships with people and connecting with other people doing cool stuff and and that's kind of how how i've made it this far yeah and i agree and i second that like that's the same way i've gotten to where i am now and how i meet all these amazing people to come onto the podcast it's just through that relationship building and you know building that like network of people i guess is a weird way to put it but uh, even just in my careers or my other businesses or any of the ventures or growth that I've had, it's all through leveraging the people around me. Um, so I love that advice and it's a good way to end it. Um, so thanks, David, for coming on to the Out and Up podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And if you guys like this episode and you're listening on iTunes, please leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe uh, or any other platform you're listening to. If you like this episode, please share with somebody in your life that 